Um, so first let's start with uh, what is GSD3 uh, caused by? The enzyme that's deficient in GSD type 3 is called human glycogen debranching enzyme or HGDE. And this is a cytoplasmic enzyme. So um, in the cell, we have uh, different compartments. And so this is in the compartment, which is called the cytoplasm, which is where all the other um, glycogen um, enzymes are other than the enzyme for pompe disease, which sits in a compartment or in a cell called the lysosome. And deep branching enzyme is very unique in that it has two functions. One is to transfer the glucose molecules and the second is to actually break the branch point of glycogen, which I'll try and share with you. It's a large gene. And if I show this to you, um, this is the structure of glycogen and each individual circle is a glucose 1-phosphate. And so this complex molecule of glycogen is broken down by two enzymes. The first, which is called glycogen phosphorylase, uh, which in the liver, um, when deficient, results in GSD type 6, and when missing or deficient in the um, uh, muscle is what we call um, type 5 glycogen storage disease. So phosphorylase really plays a key role in breaking these outer branches of glycogen, and it's responsible for about 30% of the glycogen breaking down. And the remaining 70% is now the job of debranching enzyme. And as you can see, that if debranching enzyme is not functioning well, you end up with this structure called limit dextrin, which is an abnormal structure of the glycogen. I just want us to remember this, this abnormal structure. And if we further see the dual function of debranching enzyme, the first is to, to move these three blue circles into this chain and to expose this branch point. And then this branch point is also broken. And both these jobs, moving this chain and also breaking this branch point are both done by debranching enzyme. And so by its efficient activity, 70% of the glycogen is now broken down. And then again, the interaction with glycogen phosphorylase. So it's a very dynamic process and a deficiency, as you can understand, would now result in buildup of this limit dextrin, which has the abnormal structure of glycogen, which is in multiple tissues of the body, but largely as it's understood today in the cytoplasm of liver cells and muscle cells. So muscle cells are both heart muscle cells, skeletal muscle, as well as smooth muscle cells. And so there are two types of glycogen storage disease type three that are recognized today. Again, remember it's caused by the same enzyme deficiency. It's the same gene. It's just the nature of the mutations that determines whether there's going to be liver as well as muscle involvement, which is called GSD type 3A and represents the vast majority of cases, 85% of cases. And then there is 3B, which represents 15% of the cases where only the liver is primarily affected. And so the challenges are there's a lot of variability in glycogen storage disease type 3. As we discussed, there's the muscle as well as the liver. And so the heart muscle um, can have um, thickening of the heart muscle without any symptoms or it can be with symptoms and can lead to death. And some with only muscle, skeletal muscle uh, involvement and no apparent heart involvement. So once again, we should remember this. And also in terms of heart involvement, there can be heart rhythm disturbances. And in the section for skeletal muscle, I really want um, a growing understanding here. In the past, it was considered as usually minimal in childhood. But today our understanding is changing. Um, there is muscle involvement pretty early in the disease course, as early as the first few years of life. And there are many, many different studies from around the world which shows this. And of course, then it becomes more predominant 
in adulthood with onset in the second to the third decade. It's considered slowly progressive. There can also be an exercise intolerance. There are some wheelchair users and we're definitely seeing more of this as patients get older. And the other feature is that the muscles involved are both the proximal muscles or the larger muscles, but also the small muscles of the hand and also of the feet. And then as far as the liver goes, these symptoms are reported as improving with age, but I think with time, we're also understanding there are challenges here. And overt symptoms may disappear around puberty, but some of our patients do progress. And we now see some patients who can develop liver cirrhosis or scar tissue of the liver. And in rare instances, we're also seeing hepatocellular carcinoma. So the emerging understanding of GSD-3, if I put it in a slide, um, in childhood, we know that there's low blood glucose. It's often considered a ketotic hypoglycemia or the, or the presence of blood ketones in the face of a low blood glucose. And so the presence of ketones is a compensatory mechanism uh, that the body is showing. There's an enlargement of the liver. There's a growth re retardation. We find an increase in the liver enzymes, also an increase in the muscle enzymes, the CPK. And now we're also recognizing early muscle involvement uh, where it's typically seen as developmental delay. But if we study these patients more closely, we are definitely identifying other areas which I think should be followed. And so involvement of physical therapy uh, should be done early in the disease course. Now, as these children transition and become older patients or adults, there's a decrease in the liver size a decrease in the liver enzymes, and then the muscle symptoms become more predominant. And we've also shown there can be peripheral nerve involvement, and there can be an unmasking or um, further recognition of heart muscle involvement, um, where the terminology used is cardiomyopathy. And then we are seeing some long-term complications of scarring of the liver, um, presence of uh, liver growths called adenomas, which are definitely seen a lot more often in GSD type 1. We also see liver tumors and of course our patients also uh, have wheelchair dependence. So in terms of where we have been, um, I would really refer you to these guidelines for type 3 glycogen storage disease, which was an effort done in collaboration with the American College of Medical Genetics which is our official journal or our official site uh, for practice guidelines. And this was published in July 2010. There might be some updates to this, um, but largely I think this is an important educational resource and also ability for our patients and families to use this as a guide and to also help other physicians um, to use this as a guide to manage our individuals with glycogen storage disease type three, but also to help with insurance coverage for certain um, aspects of the disease, which otherwise would not be covered. So how do we treat our individuals with GSD type three? Diet is the mainstay for many of our GSDs. The use of uncooked cornstarch or you know, a modified cornstarch, which could be glycosate or another product. The idea is to provide an alternative source of energy, but the goal is to avoid under treatment, but also to avoid over treatment. We definitely see challenges with over treatment in the form of um, type 2 diabetes um, and other complications, um, including overweight in our patients. Providing frequent small meals with these complex carbohydrates and avoiding simple meals or uh, simple sugars providing a high protein diet to provide an alternative source of energy because in this, in glycogen storage disease, the ability to make glucose from proteins is intact. So we should definitely take advantage of this pathway. And this can definitely allow a reduction in the cornstarch or the carbohydrate intake and theoretically prevent the glycogen buildup. It can improve muscle function by providing muscle the needed protein it needs rather than breaking down uh, the body's muscle protein. We can use ketones as another source of energy 
and we can use what's called anapterotic agents, which are um, abilities to provide other sources of energy, and one of them can be from medium chain fats. So the complex carbohydrates, I think this audience knows very well, but I think it's really important to continue to emphasize that overtreatment may increase the accumulation of this abnormal structure of glycogen, the limit dextrin, uh, which not only is abnormal in its quantity in terms of glycogen, but also abnormal in its quality. And this, as you can recognize, is very different from some of the other glycogen storage diseases, which is more of a quantity issue, but not so much of a quality issue. And having this abnormal structure, I think, is what also provokes the reaction in the liver of a scar tissue formation and the progression of the fibrosis. Um, so long-term complications, which include the chronic liver disease and our muscle injury, uh, still does occur with, this, um, with these kinds of interventions. So high protein diet, we've already talked about it. Um, and it's really very important to provide about 25 to 30% of the diet in the form of high protein. So working with a metabolic dietitian is very important. And um, as I stated, sometimes to achieve this amount is difficult without supplements. So um, anjuri, benny protein, there are other sources of good protein and they can improve the muscle involvement and reduce the muscle enzyme markers of injury as well as the transaminases, but by no means are we really fixing the underlying challenges, which I think still continues. We might change the rate of that progression, um, but we should be cognizant of this. And this is again um, a recognition that we do need more definitive therapies for our various glycogen storage diseases, including type three, and so even compliant patients continue to have some increases in their trans in these liver enzymes and this muscle enzyme, the CPK, especially during growth spurts, increased physical activity, reflecting inadequate energy supply from the diet. Now, a third way that we can supplement is by providing medium chain fats and MCT oil is an even carbon chain fatty acid, which will provide this additional form of energy coming from a source of fat that can be very readily utilized by the muscle as well as the heart, thus maximizing the energy stores for the muscle and liver. It actually will further prevent the increase to the total amount of carbohydrate or protein intake. And the major role and advantage is that it's providing a readily available source um, and also as an energy source to other organs like the brain. So here is a publication which really has shown that using um, a modified energy source, like using a modified Atkins diet, um, a ketogenic diet has helped at some level with the heart and skeletal muscle function in um, an individual with glycogen storage disease. But I definitely want us to look to the right where it shows that from the initiation of this 12 months later, Yes, there is a decrease in the muscle markers of injury and a decrease in the markers of um, liver as well as muscle injury. Um, but yet these abnormalities are persistent. And so, yes, there's an improvement of biochemical parameters. There's an improvement in the muscle function. There's an improvement in the exercise tolerance and quality of life. No change in the liver size that was noted in this particular situation but yet we've not completely addressed the underlying situation, which is that buildup of abnormal structural glycogen in the liver, heart muscle, skeletal muscle, and various other muscle tissues of the body. So these guidelines that we have uh, talked about definitely talks about the role of nutrition. And there are some beautiful boxes that are there to give this information in a glance or at a glance, but it might be worthwhile to also read the rest of the uh, guidelines for more details because certain sections may not have made it into these text boxes. Now let's go to the heart and the, the variable manifestations. It can be anywhere from heart muscle thickness or heart rhythm disturbances or um, buildup of um, uh, sclerosis or of um, involving the um, 
the blood vessels of the heart, uh, which can be really problematic as well. And so in terms of this, there has been a case report of a 24 year old um, male who was admitted with a life threatening heart rhythm disturbance. He had a cardiac arrest. And um, then when um, uh, reading was looked at from the blood vessels uh, of the heart, the coronary arteries, it showed that there was um, stenosis or narrowing of the um, blood vessel. And this was really considered as related to on the underlying GST type 3, which was his uh, diagnosis. So we do need to be cognizant of this. Not every patient manifests in the same way. And there could be an unmasking of certain situations based on other health risk factors, but the heart is involved. And this was a publication from our, our work at Duke, um, which shows that there is an increase in the wall thickness and in the left ventricular mass or the um, left a section of the heart over, ta over time. Um, and this is showing you the curves, which is um, just to point out to you that this is, if this is considered normal, there are increases that are noted in different measurements of the um, uh, heart as evaluated by um, an echocardiogram or um, an ultrasound of the heart, looking at um, different regions of the heart per se. And this again also is um, showing it in terms of the overall mass or the size of the heart. Uh, this can be increased. Yes, there are some which are normal. And um, these are young children, by the way. And so uh, this can also be done in older patients, which was done here. And you can see that it tends to increase over time in some patients and it can be mildly abnormal um, in, in the vast majority of our patients. So this is telling us that um, you know, nutritional management, because these are all patients that have been followed closely, can help in the situation, but we don't know what's going on at the level of um, the um, microscopic level of the heart. And so um, this is another study from a single patient um, showing that there was an improvement in the heart size when um, high protein diet was used in this patient with GSD type three. Um, but this is a study showing that there can be scar tissue or fibrosis in a patient with glycogen storage disease type 3. So using more uh, sophisticated tools can help us better understand it. So an improvement in heart size does not really tell us what's going on at the level of the um, uh, structure or in terms of scar tissue, but using these kind of uh, technologies um, and staining uh, or um, uh, use of gadolinium, which is a kind of um, uh, a, um, um, a mechanism to better look at scar tissue at the heart, one can uh, see this better. Uh, and this is a study uh, done from Duke, um, which really looked at um, groups of different individuals that had published on heart involvement in GST type 3. Uh, unfortunately, in some situations, it was done at the time of autopsy but showing that there was thickness of the heart muscle, uh, narrowing of the cavities of the heart to you know, looking at um, other uh, regions of the heart and um, showing that there can be uh, scar tissue, there can be thickness of the heart muscle, and then also there can be fibrosis or scar tissue, as I told you, if one was to use the appropriate tools. And this is, you know, the heart from a patient from uh, Canada that received a heart transplant. And you can appreciate that there's a lot of scar tissue present here. But here also I'd like to show you, this is a blood vessel. And this is a very, very narrow opening. All that's shown here is this thickness of uh, heart uh, blood vessel thickness. So, and also this is the conduction system of the heart. Uh, this is again from a paper coming out of Duke. So to tell us that different compartments of the heart can be involved and they could just be going silent, you know, unless more carefully evaluated. So uh, moving forward, um, there are cardiology recommendations, which you can see in the guidelines. And then let's talk about the muscle involvement in GSD type three, which I think really has been overlooked, especially in the pediatric age group. 
And so we do know that the involvement is complex. It can be heterogeneous. It can involve skeletal muscle. Today, we're also learning about smooth muscle. Um, so when I say smooth muscle, this is involving the gut um, and muscles, you know, like the blood vessels, but also the other heart muscles can be involved. And what was previously thought was that there was a relative sparing of the muscles in childhood, but now we definitely know that muscle involvement has been under-recognized in childhood. We do know that there is both large muscle groups or proximal muscles that are involved, but also small muscles or what we call distal muscles away from the body that can be involved. So this is an adult patient with GST type three. And as you can see, he's in a wheelchair. What I also want you to take note of is his hands. And right here, what you're noting is a significant weakness or a loss of muscle in the hands. And we have now been able to also study nerves in GST type three to say that there is peripheral nerve involvement in our patients with GST type 3A. So this is a study from another group uh, which was looking at 18 patients with GST type 3 to identify the muscle function measures. And here, the mean age was about 32 years, but the range was anywhere from 13 years to 56 years. And what they showed here was proximal muscle weakness in the lower extremities, knee extension in particular, but there was also involvement of the small muscles um, as demonstrated by difficulties with key pinch and hand grip strength. So further study showing proximal muscle involvement uh, with difficulty with standing up from the chair, standing up from sitting squat, um, this is the involvement of even the foot muscles. So again, um, the study further clarified that. Now a second study, again looking at it, but here I'd like for you to see, this is really in pediatric patients where the mean age was six years plus minus three years. And here there was gross motor delay that was reported, delayed sitting, delayed standing, delayed walking, exercise intolerance, muscle weakness um, ranging from grade three to grade four. So we usually grade it from uh, grade one to grade five. And so there is early involvement and even on uh, what we call electromyogram, which is a way to study muscle, um, there were muscle changes which were noted in uh, more than three fourths of these uh, children. So um, again, the take home message is that we are focusing on the liver and on the hypoglycemia and the ketones, but we also need to understand that there is skeletal and heart muscle involvement early in GST type three. So this is a very nice study which came out of um, the group from Sweden and um, in collaboration with the French group. Um, it was on six patients with a mean age of 27 years with GSD type three. And here they were able to show that in addition to weakness, there is an energy deficit in uh, patients with GSD type three and that symptoms of exercise intolerance can occur due to impaired muscle glycogenolysis. So what this really means is inability to break down glycogen. If you recollect, I showed you that you need both enzymes, phosphorylase as well as debranching enzyme for breaking down glycogen, what we call glycogenolysis, which is breakdown of glycogen. And so in adult patients, the main problem is distal weakness that leads to a chronic progressive myopathy leading to impaired ambulation. So this is from this paper. So again, more emergence and that exercise intolerance in GSD3 can precede the permanent muscle weakness and wasting that is noted. Um, and that probably it's underdiagnosed because moderate muscle complaints during childhood are often masked by the liver manifestations of the disease. So once again, another uh, group, another study showing that there's early muscle involvement. Now this is a study from Japan and I apologize for um, the difficulty in reviewing it, but I think the idea is if you see the onset of myopathy or muscle disease is as early as one year of age, and it can be delayed initial walking, inability to walk, slow movements, um, easy fatigue, muscle weakness of the extremities um, as has been studied, and here also um, involvement of the heart. 
So um, once again, I brought this closer so that you could see this. And so the learning to date is that now there's a new emerging understanding of the GST 3A muscle phenotype and that what was previously thought to be no muscle involvement until adulthood, we definitely are understanding that there is muscle involvement very early um, and um, we need to further evaluate and get involvement from physical therapy to help our children with GST type 3A and uh, adding to the sparse literature. So we also have an ongoing study at Duke and we hope to be publishing these data soon. And this then becomes an important aspect of management of our patients with GST type 3A uh, when thinking about clinical trials of treatment. So once again, the guidelines uh, do help us guide us uh, further uh, by telling us that standardized assessments of age appropriate developmental motor function needs to be done. Um, musculoskeletal assessments need to be done. Um, many of our patients complain of pain. Um, and so all this needs to be looked at more closely um, and really to think of GSD type 3 as a neuromuscular condition in addition to a liver glycogen storage disease. So coming back to liver manifestations in GSD type 3, our patients do have an increase in liver size with increase in liver enzymes. And over time, we know that the liver size comes down and the liver symptoms are improving with age. Um, clearly with dietary interventions, we don't see as much hypoglycemia. The liver, the glucose needs decreases as children get older. Um, but I think that what has been overlooked is the what's going on at the level of the microscope, microscopic level in terms of liver scar tissue, which has been noted early on liver biopsy. And in some instances, there can be irreversible and severe liver changes uh, in terms of cirrhosis, uh, liver adenomas, and liver carcinoma. I know that there is different thinking along this, but I think animal models will help us better understand this. And a decrease in liver size does not necessarily mean an improvement in liver status of patients. It's almost like alcoholic liver disease, where it can go silent for many years, but uh, when there is a point of uh, further challenge um, and compromise, there's an unmasking of it. And so um, this is uh, a study from the literature which our group undertook and we have published. So you can see this is uh, 36 cases uh, from the literature showing progression of liver cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma in patients with GSD3. And I think what's also important if one goes back and looks at it, Many of them actually had normal so-called liver enzymes, but liver biopsy really was the key, uh, showing regenerative nodules, fibrous septa, cirrhosis as early as seven years, um, hepatocellular carcinoma, et cetera. So I think we need to be open in our way of thinking because we really want to advance the field and to better understand how to manage our patients better. So this was a study um, done at Duke. And here we really focused on liver findings in our children with GST 3A. It was not to overlook what the muscle findings were, but here it was more to pay attention to what was going on at the level of the liver. And um, here we were able to show that these children, as we followed them over time, there was a decrease in their liver enzymes also the EST, which is a muscle enzyme, all of them coming down. But what we were seeing was that just looking at normal liver labs, did it really state that these children were actually doing perfectly well with no liver complications or muscle complications. Looking at the liver biopsy in this cohort of children, we were able to better understand um, that what was going on. So here when we I just want to show you a cartoon of this. When we're looking at the level of a liver, we're looking at what's called the blood, the vein, and we're also looking at what's going on around this triad of, of blood vessels. And when you have abnormal tissue around these blood vessels, the size of this increases, as you can see, as compared to here. And this is what it really looks like under the microscope. And just to give you a message is that many of our patients, the pediatric patients 
who actually had improved liver enzymes did have involvement of scar tissue um, at the level of the liver. And the reasons why these liver biopsies were done were sometimes you know, done by the hepatologist to better understand what was going on or at the point of um, diagnosis or consideration for um, a liver transplant in these cases. So this is one message and there are uh, recommendations of how to monitor the liver in individuals with GSD type 3. Uh, and then really the role of animal models. And so this is the curly coated retriever, which we now have um, bred down. Um, but this is a naturally occurring model of GSD 3A. We first published this in 2007. And what you can see is that they were homozygous or both genetic changes were the same uh, in the GSD3 gene. This um, sweet little dog had increases in liver enzymes, but also in muscle enzymes. And there was um, buildup of uh, glycogen. Um, and in the early stages, what we did not find was um, fibrosis or fat, but um, this is how we have studied this model be better to again give you how we can learn from animal models to better guide us in terms of what's going on at the level of our children and adults. So you can see here the liver enzymes and this dotted line is the upper limits of normal. You can see that initially these liver enzymes are going up, but then over time it's coming down. And this is the two liver and muscle enzymes. This is the muscle enzyme. And this is a biomarker that we have developed at Duke, which is a marker of glycogen buildup. Again, you can see it's going up and over time it's coming down. So when things are coming down, we want to say that things are going well. Um, but what I'm going to point out to you, this is using the liver as an example, but the same data apply for the muscle data. You can see in the early stages, the liver enzymes are going up. So saying that you know, the liver is reacting. Then as the liver continues to progress, all this blue material is scar tissue. You can see there's an increase or a stabilization of these high liver enzymes. And then as there's more liver damage, these liver enzymes are actually coming down. So this is at the point of what we call cirrhosis or uh, furtherance of the scar tissue of the liver. And so the same applies for what we learned with the muscle enzymes. And so this uh, canine model has taught us a lot. And of course the mouse model has also taught us a lot. And also this biomarker of GLUP4 which is a biomarker of glycogen storage, helped us further understand a correlation with what's going on at the level of liver and muscle. So now the importance of biomarkers in GSD type 3. I've talked about the GLUC4, and this is actually a limit dextrin of glycogen. It's a breakdown product, this GLUC4. It's increased in GSD type 3, and we actually have a paper currently under review um, showing the utility. And this has also been shown by other groups. Uh, we have tried to uh, study this further of um, whether a spot sample is as good as the need to collect it over a 24 hour sample. We've used this largely also in Pompe disease or glycogen storage disease type two. And it's a utility, the utility of this is a biomarker for not just diagnosis, but also monitoring individuals with Pompe and now I would say also with GSD type three. So this is the GLUC4 as it's decreasing with age. And again, this goes along with the lessons that we learned from the K9 model that a decrease in GLUC4 may not necessarily be a good thing. It could be if the patient really has shown a remarkable improvement on a definitive therapy where the abnormal glycogen is removed from muscle and liver. But in this situation, it really could mean that there's more scar tissue going on at the level of the muscle and or liver. So um, the other point is the role of MRI. And MRI is a way of, for or magnetic resonance in imaging, has been used for other muscle diseases. And so in normal healthy non-GSD patients, there is some muscle fat content, which varies by individual and location. But in general, it's about three to 5% of individual muscle groups. In some locations, it could be up to 10%. So 
So this is really, um, again, data that we have published and we're continuing to study is this is a volunteer and this is now looking at the deltoid or one of the shoulder muscles. And so this is an, an individual with G GSD type three. And this is what we call proton density fat fraction, a way of quantitating this fat involvement. So in a normal individual, we see it as about 3% or 4%. And in someone with GSD type three, all this white material, which is highlighted here in green is showing that there's an increase in fat that's building up. In terms of function, this individual is doing actually quite well, but this is showing you that this can be occurring because of this buildup of glycogen. Now looking at a muscle of the, um, of, of, of the gluteus or the, um, um, of the butt muscle, so to say, uh, you can see this significant involvement um, and it can vary from the two sides as well. Um, but once again, showing you that this is occurring in um, a young patient with GSD type 3A. So I want to conclude by not giving a message that um, we are not doing good by our patients. The dietary interventions and the improvements in dietary intervention has definitely been life-saving. We have many adults with GSD 3A. They've undergone successful pregnancy, successful, you know, ability to work, uh, etc. But many of our adults with GSD3 are complaining of muscle involvement, um, of muscle fatigue, of difficulty with climbing stairs, of difficulties with activities of daily living, of difficulty with buttoning and unbuttoning, and the recognition that muscle disease occurs early in childhood um, is something that I wanted to bring to attention so that we can give more to our children with GSD type 3. Uh, of course, there is also a liver involvement. And I just want to close by saying there is a need for more definitive therapies to prevent the sequelae in the heart, liver, and muscle. And the future for our patients with GSD3 is excellent with many th therapies on the horizon, whether it's an, um, an mRNA approach with lipid nanoparticles or a gene therapy approach or a small molecule approach or a combination approach. I just want us to leave with letting our families know that work is ongoing. Our goal is to provide more and more for our patients, but recognition of what the challenges are is important so that we can provide the best possible care for our patients. And I really want to acknowledge our patients, their families, our funding sources, our team at, at Duke, um, which includes the bench, the bedside, hepatologist, uh, dietitian, pathologist, neurologist, physical therapist, um, clinical team, um, uh, speech pathologists, and then our national and international collaborators. And I really want to thank the AGSD for um, giving me this um, opportunity to speak and trying to um, increase our understanding of uh, GSD type three. Thank you so very much.